So hopefully this is recording. I just did the talk once and then I found out I didn't record it at all. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> so obviously we're going to do macro evolution and I'm obviously not here. Hi, Mr. Nguyen. Hi, period zero. Hi, period five. I'm going to talk fast just because this room is swelteringly hot and it's 440. I'm the last human here at Westminster High School and I would like to go home. So obviously... If you need to pause this video, feel free to pause it, Mr. Nguyen. Um, kids, I'm gonna kids. You're not you're not baby goats. So period zero and period five. I'm probably gonna post this online, and I'll also put a link up so that per your leisure you can watch it as well. If, you know, if you wanted to backfill anything that you needed. So the question that we're gonna be attempting to answer is how do microevolutionary mechanisms lead to the new species? Microevolutionary mechanisms, meaning natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, mutations, net mutations, and then some type of sexual selection, non-random mating. Because that's the bigger deal. How do we get these new species to come into existence? So this falls under a category of what we call macroevolution, which is looking at the big picture. And technically, macroevolution deals with looking at new species, but also their lineages. So this is only really part of the picture. So as you can tell from the figure at the right, which is often used, and there's lots of issues with the pictures, hence I have the text, do you see the flaw in the picture? It's actually flaws, not just flaw. But microevolution, if you could see the pointer moving around a little bit, down here where it says microevolution, this here just deals with allele frequency changes over time. That one, easy to observe. Macroevolution, or speciation, is how you can drive from one species to another. The catch is, it's not necessarily this nice straight linear relationship. So this one, I'm going to tell you one of the flaws. But it's normally branching. It's not just a straight here to here. Because what one of the arguments that shows up is, well, if lizards turn into roadrunners, how can we still have lizards? That's because there's a flaw in the drawing. It's not a nice linear relationship. So, in order to go about this, we need to remember what species turn out to be. And so we have our functional definition, which is perfectly flawed. There are lots of issues with it, but it's the one that we're going to use. And that is, species turn out to be when you have two distinct organisms living in the same area at the same time, and what they can turn out to do is reproduce. If they reproduce and they make an offspring, and that offspring can then reproduce... Congratulations, we have the same species. If they cannot reproduce, or they cannot make an offspring, or they cannot make an offspring that can then reproduce, you don't happen to have the same species. So that's where the horse and the donkey fall into play. So horse, donkey, same area, same time, they reproduce, they have an offspring, so it gets born, it's called a mule. The catch is the mule cannot reproduce. Therefore, the horse and the donkey are not the same under this definition. Again, under this definition, they are not the same species. So, in order for us to deal with making new species, the basic part that we need to grapple with is preventing reproduction. And the way that you need to prevent reproduction happens in a whole bunch of ways, and I'll go over that one next. But basically what happens is we have an initial population and something is making a reproductive divide. Somehow, they're not all reproducing with each other. There's a split. The result of the split is one or both of those subpopulations is going to be a tad small. When it's a tad small, hopefully what immediately ran through your mind is genetic drift. The result is the two populations are going to become genetically distinct. Because a large population will be driven by natural selection, whereas a small population is driven by genetic drift, and who knows what shows up next. The result is once one that small population or both populations reach the size where they undergo natural selection, natural selection on this on this blue population will be much different than natural selection on the green population. They will have different selective pressures for whatever reason because of their genetics or because of where they are, because of their behavior, something's going to make them be different. 
and natural selection is going to drive a wedge between the two. And once they can't reproduce with each other, even if you put them in the same area at the same time and produce a viable offspring, congratulations, we have new species. If we were to try and actually split them apart, the step one, like I said, is we need to reproductively block them. Well, you can do that one of two ways. You can prevent reproduction from happening in the first place, or once they've reproduced, we can just kill off the child or don't let the child do what it wants to do. So that's where these ones come in. Your first inclination is to copy down the words habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavioral isolation, mechanical isolation, and there's another one over here which is gametic isolation, and say, I need to memorize these and I need to look up the definitions. Okay, good for you, but I, I don't care. I'm not going to ask you which of the following is not a type of isolation and just dro word drop on you. The bigger deal is can you figure out what happened? Meaning, if you split two split a population up because you put a barrier in between. Oh, we've isolated them, they can't reproduce. That falls under habitat isolation. If they live in two different areas and they only reproduce when there's so much sunlight out, but because of how spread out the population is or something goes on so that the timing is different, meaning they reproduce at different times, that's what we call temporal isolation. You're stopping them from mating because they reproduce at different times. If one has a particular fancy, it pref the organism prefers one behavior, one type of food, one type of smell, one type of light amount as opposed to another, that's what we call behavioral isolation. They're, do they're choosing things that drive a wedge. Mechanical isolation is the parts cannot fit. So however you choose to interpret that, but the pieces, when you stick them together, they do not interact with each other. The other option, is, like I said, is gametic isolation, and that is when the sperm and egg look at each other and they say, I don't know what's going on. All of those prevent fertilization, meaning the egg runs into the sperm, voila, organism. That's what fertilization means. So we can prevent fertilization from occurring, or once there is fertilization, what we can do is prevent the offspring from reproducing. So how could you do that? Well, hybrid viability, viability is your ability to grow up. So if we can take it out while it's developing or have it die in its youth, typically this is more of a, it will, the, the fertilized egg, the zygote, to speak fancy, will divide a couple of times, reach a certain state, and go, eh, forget this, and just die. So reduce the hybrid viability is you kill, off, kill it off early. Hybrid breakdown is you make it past the early stages, you just can't make it. There's something wrong with you, the organism that, tried, that was the product of this fertilization, or it's your children that turned out to reproduce, that turned out to have issues. Alternative is reduced hybrid fertility, which is you just can't, you're sterile, you can't reproduce. So this one here, fertility would be when you get the mule, which is the donkey and the horse. The mule is, is, has no fertility, it has reduced fertility, it's sterile. But let's assume that it could reproduce. If it, the mules reproduce with other mules, their children might have issues, which is that hybrid breakdown. So... First generation issues, you can't reproduce with that first generation. The grandchildren, there's issues with them. But if you can make it past this point and have viable, they can survive, fertile, they can have kids, offspring, meaning two sets of generations later, then congratulations, they're the same species. If you were to read the course description for AP Biology, and if you haven't, you really need to read the course description for AP Biology. Not because it's such an exciting read, not because it's the most amazing th document produced. It's because of the fact that this is what your test is going to be on, and it's what I'm testing you on, with a few exceptions. It's what I'm going to test you on. So much like with AP World, you're downloading the aspects of it and printing them out and trying to memorize what's going on. 
Well, all that giant list that I gave you earlier in the year that said here are your test objectives, I pulled those straight out of the document. So all the things I've been asking you on your quizzes and I will ask you on your test, I can justify somewhere on that list of objectives or learning objectives that I was given by the college board. So it might be a good document to look at. If you look at that document, what you will notice is they wish you to know only two types of speciation mechanisms. One of them is called allopatric, one of them is called sympatric. The peripatric and the parapatric, they don't care for those. The pattern is still the same, however. So for all of these, the pattern is we happen to have the same population. Something is causing a barrier. There's some type of reproductive barrier, however that showed up. Because there's a reproductive barrier, the two are going to become genetically different. The two populations become genetically different. How does that happen? That happens because you happen to have genetic drift and or natural selection. The result will be, over time wedging the two apart, you'll have two distinct species. If they are close enough together, what you will notice is there's actually this range, this area where either both species are going to exist at the same time, or they still kind of, sort of, can reproduce. It's very weird, but it, they do exist. Eventually, usually, the two get driven apart so that they aren't necessarily overlapping. So some examples. This one is going to be for allopatric. Allo means different. Patri means fatherland or where you live. And so this is dealing with the porkfish, obviously, because it says porkfish. And they used to actually live all in the exact same location. We know that by finding fossils of all the same type of porkfish based upon their skeletons. And we know that they happen to live somewhere around here, somewhere around the Caribbean and the connection between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Around one in, or three and a half million years ago, there was a division that showed up. Well, how do we know that? If you look at this area here, the connector between North and South America, where you find the Isthmus of Panama, you will find along this region fish fossils. Well, there's only fish fossils if there were fish once living there. There's no other logical explanation for it that's really easy. Hence, the principle of parsimony. Easiest answer wins. So all along here, we turn out to have organisms living. Good for them. Well, at some point, about three and a half million years ago, they stopped showing up. Why? Because clearly it wasn't in the water anymore. And once they weren't in the water, we now physically separated two populations, some population over here in the Atlantic, some population over here in the Pacific, and the result was allopatric speciation. They lived in separate areas. Smaller populations, they become genetically distinct. Natural selection behaved on them differently two new species. Sympatric speciation, however, is a little bit more difficult. Sim means together or with. Patri, again, is fatherland, meaning these live in the same area at the same time. So the only way you could drive them apart is one of two things, for the most part. They need to have different behaviors or different genetics. So, these type of fish here are called cichlids. You find them all over Africa and South America. They're little itty bitty things. And you find them in pools of water by the quadrillions, it seems. If you've ever seen pools of cichlids, they're all over the place. So if you look at these guys, what you will notice is some of them might have behavioral difference, kind of like with us. Some of us like to eat, well, these are extreme examples, so it doesn't apply to humans. But some cichlids prefer to eat fit other fish, some cichlids prefer to eat snails, some prefer algae, insects, leaves, or zooplankton. It's not zooplankton, it's pronounced zooplankton. So whichever one you tend to want to eat, fish eaters are probably going to hang out with other fish eaters, leaf eaters are probably going to hang out with other leaf eaters, insect eaters are probably going to hang out with other insect eaters. It just makes sense. Well, if you're hanging out with certain organisms because of your choices, your behavior, either because it's what you want to eat or how you wish to reproduce, whatever, you're going to tend to reproduce with whoever you're hanging out with. 
So the fish eaters are going to reproduce with the fish eaters. The leaf eaters are going to reproduce with the leaf eaters. Insect eaters reproduce with the insect eaters. And the result is we now have smaller populations that will become genetically distinct, that once large enough will be driven by natural selection differently, even though they're in the exact same pond. And the result will be fish eating cichlids, leaf eating cichlids, insect eating cichlids that are all in the exact same pond that are different species, that are incapable of mutual reproduction. It seems weird, but it's pretty straightforward. The other weirdo is what we would call genetic. This is something that tends to occur in plants because animals seem to be relatively intolerant of mess-ups with our DNA. So these two here are called anemone flowers. I know that because it says anemone right there, in case you weren't sure. The one on the left has one particular set of chromosomes, and the one on the right has double the set of chromosomes. So what happens is this one here can reproduce with this, an, a, a plant that has this set of chromosomes can reproduce with other plants with this set of chromosomes. This plant over here had something go wrong. Oops, oh well. The result is it has double the set of chromosomes. What that turns out to mean is the one on the right, the anemone flower on the right, can only reproduce with other anemone flowers that have this setup of chromosomes. They have become isolated because their gametes will not recognize each other because it was a genetic difference. There's a genetic wedge. How did it come about? Oops. We turn out to have the exact same phenomenon with our closest ape relative called a bonobo. They turn out to have 24 pairs of chromosomes, and humans have 23. We had an oops that occurred where two of the bonobo chromosomes fused together, and they became one of our chromosomes. The result is the 24 set of chromosomes as a gamete, meaning a sperm or an egg, does not recognize the sperm or an egg of a 23 chromosome organism, or 23 pair chromosome organism. They don't match. The result is a division. And it is as simple as an oops. So let's give you some more concrete examples. So these ones here are dealing with finches. And this is actually something that has been observed within my lifetime, which is what makes it mildly exciting. So this observation started in 1981, the year I was born. And it was confirmed that we have two distinct, that we have new species as of... 2009. So you were definitely alive when this one happened. So what you turn out to have here are three distinct species of finches. This one here is called, was actually a migrant finch that somehow blew over into the Galapagos. This one here is called a cactus finch. This one here is called a ground finch. What we used to have is we had all three of these that were relatively new to the Galapagos Islands. This one showed up by accident in 1981. They actually had a series of droughts and storms and all sorts of bad things happening on one of, the, one of the islands where these three turn out to exist in the Galapagos, and it killed off these two birds. For the most part, they just disappeared. There are, there's a family, it's a husband-wife pair. I can't remember the first names. I want to say one of them's like Peter and the other one's Mary, but I'm most likely wrong. But their last name is Grant. That one I do know. So they're just referred to as the Grants. They're actually insanely famous for studying the finches in the Galapagos Islands. And they confirmed that this little newcomer finch here that showed up in 1981, that there are now finches occupying the niches of the ground finch and the cactus finch in the Galapagos Islands that used to be occupied by the cactus finch and the ground finch. So, we had this original population of these newcomers. Something wiped these two out, and versions of this finch, this new immigrant finch, took over, and some of them said, hey, we like hanging out around cacti. And some of them said, hey, we like to hang out on the ground. And they have proliferated to the point where we have three distinct species of finches. We have this starter finch, we have the cactus finch, we have the ground finch, all in the same location. 
We have witnessed this in my lifetime. This particular plant here has been observed across the United States in over something like the last hundred years or so. This is simply because of the number of chromosomes. So I don't remember what the name of this particular plant is. It's a famous plant and that's why I don't remember it. The 4N means it has four sets of chromosomes. 2N means it has two sets of chromosomes. It, I don't remember which one was the starting species. I, I really don't. And it doesn't matter. The catch is within a hundred years we have witnessed one species of this particular particular type of plant due to speciation in particular some type of genetic isolation of sympatric origin we have gone from one species to five species within a century and I'm pretty sure humans have been staring long enough that we can keep track for a century this stuff has happened within our lifetimes Here's another example. This one here, we've already seen. This is the new immigrant. Actually, this is, pardon me, this is an original ground finch from the Galapagos. This little guy here is what we call a black cap. It's a bird that normally exists in Spain and Germany. And what we've noticed is some birds, they tend to stay in Spain during the winter and Germany during the summer, just because they prefer those temperatures. And what happened is some of them realized that they could travel a different location and they went instead of going from Germany to Spain they went from Germany to England and since we now had some that preferred the shorter flight distance for the winter time some of them preferred the hot winter and some preferred the colder winter we had and the flight distance what we started to get was two distinct sets of these black fin these black caps excuse me where we had some that preferred the Spain Germany route and some preferred the Britain Germany route well since they're behaving in different ways we have witnessed over the past I believe it's something like 50 years a split in the population of these black caps and the result is we have new species of black caps and like I said, we have witnessed this within the last 50 years. There are teachers on this campus who were born, there is one of these species, and now there are two of them. So it's not like we don't observe speciation. It's a lie when people say we don't observe it. The reason why it's an issue about the timing is it's all in how you view it. So this here is an, two models. One of them is referred to as gradualism, the other one's called punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism basically means you slowly see a change in from one species to another. Gradualism, or pardon me, punctuated equilibrium, punctuated every once in a while. Equilibrium, there's periods of nothing going on. What we notice is nothing happening, then boom, something new. Nothing happening, boom, something new, then still nothing happening. The people who bring up punctuated equilibrium tend to be Paleo or um, paleobiologists, so archaeologists, people who like to deal with fossils, paleontologists. When you look at a fossil record, all you have are bones or imprints to deal with. It doesn't tell you much about their behavior. And because of that, what you get is some kind of distinct sets of what you think a species turns out to be. You can't watch these things. All you can do is well, I see a new structure here, so I'm going to call this a new species. I see this hip bone is slightly shaped differently, therefore it's a new species. But you don't tend to find those too often in the fossil record. We, looking at things occurring right now, can witness slow changes over time. The result is we see things gradually changing. But if you look at the fossils, the remnants of things in the past, you don't get to see the slow changes. You just get to see whatever shows up in the fossil record, which is just luck, and you just see jumps. So which one is it? Odds are it's both. Because why can't it be all dependent upon the time that you look at stuff? If you want to look at the big picture, this is what you see. You'll see punctuated equilibrium. If you wish to look at it things year by year, decade by decade, you'll see this. But the thing is, it occurs by having some type of 
shift. We are reproductively isolating a population, so we're splitting them apart. Something is causing them to split. When you split the populations, they will become genetically distinct. Thank you to mutations, thank you to gene flow, thank you to genetic drift, thank you to natural selection. And then, once we have that wedge seriously in there, natural selection will continue to split them apart until you have two distinct species. That is how we get, in part, everything that we see on Earth. It's a very simple process that utilizes microevolution, which is the best part. To add the speciation bit in, all we have to do is add a reproductive isolation. Once we add a reproductive isolation, you can explain the rest. Ugh, this stuff is fantastic.